Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of April 22nd, 2013. This is Amal Matu from University of Maryland, and this week's case is sent to us again from Australia. It's a lot of great EKGs, or ECGs, I should say, in Australia, and the folks down there have been very nice in sending me some great cases. This case was sent by Dr., and I sure hope I get this name right, Dr. Amitava Mukhopadhyay. I hope I got that right. Uh, and Amitava works at the Flinders Medical Center in South or Southern Australia. And he was taking care of a 78-year-old man that presented to the emergency department complaining of syncope, a very common complaint in emergency medicine. I love syncope because you always get a 12-lead ECG with those cases, and so you get to scrutinize that ECG for some fun stuff. Anyway, this 78-year-old man had a history of ischemic heart disease and chronic renal failure. So we've already got our disposition. 78 years old, syncope, history of heart disease and renal problems. You know this patient's coming into the hospital, so you might as well just go ahead and send off your CBC, your Chem 1000, every lab test you can think of, and, of course, you're going to start the workup with the 12 lead ECG. Now I put this slide in here just as a simple reminder of the critically important things you've always got to look at on the ECG when you have a patient presenting with syncope. Now this is not a comprehensive list, but these are the key features that I like to think of when the history and physical are not necessarily revealing these are the things you've got to look for. You always look for dysrhythmias and, of course, ischemia. Everyone always thinks of those things. Most people remember WPW and long QT. The few other things that people often forget about are Brugada syndrome. We've talked about that. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We've talked about that. And one thing that we haven't talked about is arrhythmogenic right, ventric right ventricular dysplasia, which is... Uh, it tends to be more common only in certain ethnic groups in certain countries. We very rarely see this in the United States, so I don't talk about this too much uh, around here. But say, uh, for example, in Italy, I believe uh, they see more cases of this and in certain Mediterranean populations. And uh, so it's, it's something worth thinking about if you're working out there or if you have a patient from uh, from that uh, descent. Anyway, uh, it is important to think about these things. You could probably come up with a few other things on this differential, things like PE and electrolytes and overdoses and so on. But I like to think of this list because these are the things that you've got to think about that you won't get from a history and a physical exam. You've got to think about these things. Anyway, let's move on. Here's the 12 lead ECG that Amitava provided us. The 78 year old guy has sinus rhythm. There's upright P waves, as you'll notice, in the um, uh, in all of the limb leads and inverted P waves in lead AVR, so that means this uh, sinus this is sinus rhythm, and you'll also notice that on the rhythm strip there are wide QRS complexes every other beat that are coming early, and whoop, not that one, um, and so this is. Uh, essentially sinus rhythm with frequent PVCs, for the most part in a pattern of ventricular bigeminy. You might also notice when you look at the intervals that there is a prolonged PR interval. So there's a first degree AV block and there's ventricular bigeminy. There's just going through our list of things, there's no evidence of short PR and delta waves or there's no WPW. The QT is kind of tough to read, uh, but if you if you use the what I call the poor man's QT interval, we've talked about this before. Take halfway between two QRS complexes, and if the T wave ends before the halfway point of two QRS complexes, as it does here, the end of the T wave is right there. Then that means essentially that this is a normal QT. So this is not a case of prolonged QT interval and there's no hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, very unlikely in a 78-year-old guy to make a first diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but you'd see very, very large QRS complexes, and you really don't see that. And what else? Arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, again, unlikely in a 78-year-old guy to make the first diagnosis, and maybe some other time we'll talk about that, but you look for these things called epsilon waves and T-wave inversions in V1, V2, V3. Not present here. <clears throat> And there are, uh, there's not much in terms of dysrhythmia except for the bigeminy and the first gravy block. And the one thing that we haven't talked about 
looking for is signs of ischemia. So look carefully at the ST segments and hopefully you notice this is a bit subtle, but hopefully everyone's noticing that there's just a tad bit of ST depression in leads V1, V2, V3, and in V4. It's a little bit more prominent in V2 and V3, but very subtle in V1 and V4. ST depression in the anteroseptal leads. So when you see ST depression in the anteroseptal leads, there's a few things that you've got to think about. ST depression in the anteroseptal leads First thing, of course, you're going to think about is anteroseptal ischemia, but please remember that this can also be a mark of posterior STEMI, and there's a few other things. Uh, right bundle branch block oftentimes will give you some ST depression there. Hypokalemia will give you U waves and ST depression. There's a few other things. While there's no right bundle, there's no U waves, uh, and really the two things that you've got to think about whenever you're debating the possibility of ischemia is anteroseptal ischemia versus posterior STEMI. How do you tell the difference there between these two things? Well, I like to think of posterior STEMI as the mirror image opposite of septal STEMI. So think for just a second about what you see when you're looking at a septal STEMI. All right, septal STEMI, you're looking to look in leads V1, V2, V3, and what you'll see in those leads is ST segment elevation, you'll see inverted T waves, and over the course of a few hours, you'll start to develop Q waves. A posterior STEMI is the exact opposite. So instead of seeing ST segment elevation, you see ST segment depression. That's not chlamydia, that's ST segment depression, okay? Instead of inverted T waves, what you'll see is upright T waves. And instead of developing Q waves over the course of a few hours, you start developing tall R waves in V1, V2, V3 over the course of a few hours. So that's how you diagnose the posterior STEMI. And sometimes people, uh, and I learned this also back when I was in, in medical school, sometimes people will say, well, the easy thing to do whenever you see ST depression, V1, V2, V3, and you're thinking, is this posterior STEMI? Just take that 12 lead EKG, ECG, and flip it upside down. Just take the whole darn thing and invert it, um, flip it upside down and backwards. And if you do that here with this 12 lead ECG, this is what you end up seeing. So again, just a reminder, this is V3, this is V2, and that is lead V1. And so when you flip this thing upside down and invert it, and then look at the 12 lead, well, people say it's now it's a little bit easier to see the signs of infarction, all right? Uh, so it becomes very easy to see this person has uh, QRS complexes that look like they're having a STEMI uh, right there in the new V1, V2, V3 after you've inverted it. Well, you know, that's not going to really distinguish between anteroseptal ischemia because anteroseptal ischemia will give you the same appearance also. So what I like to do is I like to use posterior leads. All right. Uh, so recall that this is the normal lead placement of the um, the ECG, the, the precordial V leads. And uh, for anyone wondering, this, uh, this is what my abdomen, my washboard looks like. It's a self-portrait. Unfortunately, my washboard is actually covered up by several layers of other soft tissue. But, uh, but well, maybe one day. Um, so this is what the normal lead placement is with V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6, what I usually like to do is I just take a couple of these leads and I, uh, I flip them out to the left mid-back area <clears throat> and I put them right under the scapula. Now in this diagram, there's actually three leads back there. Eh, a lot of patients don't have enough room back there for three leads. So I just take two of these leads and I stick them right back there in the left mid-back area under the tip of the scapula. Granted, some of our patients, including a couple that I saw last night, have enough room back there for an entire 12 lead in this day and age. But anyway, just, just take a couple of leads and put them out there in the left mid-back area and then simply repeat the 12 lead. We'll call that V8 and V9. And if the patient's having a posterior STEMI 
in those leads that you put on their left mid back area when you repeat the 12 lead you will see ST segment elevation and that tells you that the patient's having a posterior STEMI so if you want to know if somebody's having a posterior STEMI just use a couple of posterior leads and if there's elevation back there then that means that they're having a posterior STEMI if there's no elevation in those posterior leads, then call it anterosseptal ischemia, right? So simple enough. If you want to diagnose posterior STEMI, look for ST elevation in the posterior leads. If it's anterosseptal ischemia and not a STEMI, but just anterosseptal ischemia, then you will not see elevation in those posterior leads. So I think that's simple enough. So if you take a look at this 12 lead ECG, there is ST segment depression, V1, V2, V3. There is upright, there are upright T waves, V1, V2, and V3. And if you were to repeat this 12 lead in a few hours, you'd probably see these R waves growing larger and larger and larger because they're developing cues in the back of the heart. So this, this is a posterior STEMI. And in this particular case, uh, the um, Amitava didn't actually have enough time to do the posterior leads because what happened was about 15 minutes after arrival, the patient went into ventricular tachycardia and shortly after that, the patient became pulseless and now is in full-blown cardiac arrest. Uh, well, they quickly did CPR on this patient and got return of spontaneous circulation. Then the patient went off to uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, which was successful. And you can see how happy the patient is standing there with his wife afterwards. The patient ended up, no surprise, having a 100% RCA lesion and a 50% left circumflex lesion. And uh, that would uh, corroborate the fact that he was having a posterior STEMI, all right? So, and by the way, the initial electrolytes were normal and the initial troponin is normal. I always like to highlight that because people become very, very dependent on troponins. Please remember two important things. Number one, patients will have normal troponins if they're simply having ischemia. Ischemia usually doesn't bump your troponin. They have to start having myocyte death before you'll bump your troponin. You have to have infarction before you'll bump your troponin. So a normal troponin can occur even in really, really sick people that are having unstable angina. Second important point is that very early in the course of an infarction, your troponin will be normal. It takes several hours before your troponin will elevate even if they are having a full-blown infarction. So the key point here is simply don't rely on troponins. Certainly don't rely on one troponin for anything. All right. So this patient fortunately ended up doing okay. We'll go on to the take-home points. First of all, when you see ST segment depression in the anteroseptal leads, the two most important things you've got to consider are, is this posterior STEMI or is this anteroseptal ischemia? How do you tell the difference? Well, posterior STEMI is going to give you ST segment depression with upright T waves. Anteroseptal ischemia is probably going to give you ST depression with inverted T waves. And if you're several hours into the course, the posterior STEMI will probably start showing you tall R waves in those anteroseptal leads, whereas anteroseptal ischemia will not show you tall R waves in the anteroseptal leads. So you can remember all of that, or you know what, do the simple thing. Anytime you see ST segment depression in the anteroseptal leads, get posterior leads. Take two leads, take two or three leads and stick them in the left mid back area and repeat the 12 lead. And if there's ST segment elevation in your left mid back, in other words, your posterior leads, you're done, that's a posterior STEMI. Give them lytics or send them to the cath lab. If there's no ST segment elevation in your posterior leads, then fine, go ahead and simply call it anteroseptal ischemia. And the final take home point, please remember, patients come in with syncope, you've got to look at all of those things that we talked about on the ECG. You look for WPW, prolonged QT, dysrhythmias, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Brigada syndrome, and look very carefully for signs of cardiac ischemia. You don't want to miss that, and you want to move quickly. This patient had a cardiac arrest within 15 minutes of arrival. Get that 12-lead ECG early, 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 
and scrutinize it carefully and move quickly, uh, just as they did in this particular case. So my thanks to Amitava for sending a great case to share with all of us. And I hope this was helpful. And I look forward to talking to all of you next week. Bye for now.